Welcome back to the Island 54 devlog. Today, I'll show you how I implemented pathfinding in my MMO. Last episode, I added a troll to the game. He would turn to face you and attack you if you got too close, but he was pretty easy to avoid given he couldn't move. In this episode, I will implement server-side pathfinding so the troll will actually chase you, hopefully making him a much more compelling adversary. To start with, I'll go over some pathfinding theory I'll then show you how I implemented pathfinding in my game. And lastly, I'll do a demo of the troll chasing the player. As always, there are links in the description below. Anyone who's done any significant development in Unity will probably be familiar with the ideas of agents and nav meshes. Agent is a component placed on game objects that you want to be able to move around your scene. A nav mesh is a pre-computed data needed to help the agents make decisions about where they can and can't go. So what's actually happening under the hood? At its core, pathfinding is all about manipulating and searching graphs. Not the kind you use to represent series of data graphically, but the network kind with vertices and edges. There are three main phases to pathfinding. They are graph building or nav mesh building, search, and path smoothing. Graph building can be slow, so it tends to be done as part of compiling the game if possible. This is the process of analyzing the scene and finding an efficient way of representing the scene as a graph. The goal is to break the navigable parts of the world up into convex polygons. A graph vertex or cell is used to represent each of those convex polygons. Graph edges or portals are then used to join adjacent polygons. Once you've built your graph, you have a drastically simplified view of the scene, and it's not difficult to see why this view makes it easier to navigate. Now the pathfinding algorithm just needs to decide which cells it will move between. The search space has been massively cut down. Phase two is to run a search algorithm over your graph. One of the most popular is A star. It's a pretty simple algorithm. Anytime it considers a point along a possible path, it considers two things, the actual cost to get there and an estimate of what it thinks it might cost to go the rest of the way. A star prioritizes paths with the lowest expected total cost. If you use an estimate like the straight line distance to the destination, then the search will tend to try alternatives that head in roughly the right direction. It's a great algorithm for pathfinding. With a couple of subtle caveats, it's guaranteed to find the best possible path while avoiding obstacles, and it tends to find the best path pretty quickly. There's a problem though. The graph was a very abstract view of the world. Each vertex might have covered quite a bit of area, so the resulting path when mapped back into the world might not seem so efficient all of a sudden. And this is why there needs to be a third stage, path smoothing or string pulling. In this stage, the points on the path get shifted around to cut closer to corners and take straighter lines when it's beneficial. It's just like laying a piece of string along the path returned from A star, then tugging on the ends to get rid of all the extra slack. The path returned from A star will get straighter and hug corners more closely. A fairly simple algorithm here is called simple stupid funnel algorithm. In this algorithm, you maintain a pair of line segments sharing a common starting point, or apex. These lines form a funnel. You can picture the funnel as having both a left and right arm. The algorithm then considers each of the shared mesh edges that were crossed when traveling through a portal from one cell to another. For each portal, it tries narrowing the funnel. It ignores endpoints that would widen the funnel, but if the arms of the funnel ever cross, then the path must be going around a corner. So it moves the apex forward to the detected corner and emits a new point into the final path. And that's basically how pathfinding works in pretty much every game out there. I would have loved to have used an off-the-shelf solution like Unity's, but I had a couple of challenges. My mob pathfinding has to happen on the server, and because of my server architecture, I needed it to be largely stateless. Any state it holds needs to be persisted off in a shared store, so I can't just assume the graph can hang around in memory. Before I could implement any pathfinding myself, I needed my server to have an understanding of the terrain geometry. So I started off by porting my terrain mesh generation code over to TypeScript. Instead of loading the height maps from the server, then generating its own mesh, the client now just fetches a representation of the mesh directly from the server. This was a pretty major simplification on the client side. I had some pretty hairy bugs when I first tried it out. While I couldn't solve these on stream, I did record my process. I made a video of me hunting down and fixing the most serious of the bugs. It's unscripted and lightly edited only for brevity. I thought it might make a nice compromise for people who want to see more of my process, but don't have time for my daily streams. I've posted it over on my new Patreon page. You don't need to pay for access to the video. I just thought it would be a nice way of promoting this new way of supporting the series. 
so feel free to check out that video if you're interested. There's a link in the description below. I further changed the mesh generation code to support the various terrain materials, stone, sand and grass. I also added a simpler mechanism for adding entities into my game. Instead of setting all the various components and properties through the rest endpoint, you can now specify a prefab. The server goes and loads a template entity from a YAML file, making everything more easily reproducible and less error prone. Before implementing a proper pathfinding algorithm, I implemented a hacky but really simple and surprisingly effective algorithm. It just draws a line from the origin to the destination, then drops a number of points down. For each of those points, it checks which hexagon it should be part of, and treats that hexagon center as the next point in the path. It's never going to be able to avoid obstacles, and tends to make the troll clip through or hover over the terrain, but it was a good first step and proof of concept. It was now time to generate my search graph. I don't want to bother with any optimization at this point, so I just create a single graph node, which I call a cell, for each triangle in the terrain mesh. I link adjacent cells with what I call a portal. Portals between cells within the same chunk are really straightforward. They record the cells they run between, the cost to traverse them, and the shared mesh edge that gets crossed when traversing the portal. But I need to have things a little less connected when the graph crosses chunk boundaries, otherwise the graph will go on literally forever. My plan was to have the search algorithm load up chunks of the graph as needed. That way, I don't need to work out which chunks might be needed in the final solution, which would potentially involve loading heaps of data, and may unreasonably limit the search if it needs to take a long detour. So I reused the hex mod coordinates described by Sander Evers over on Observables HQ and covered by me in episode 13 of this devlog series. Whenever I need to link to a cell in another chunk, I just record the chunk coordinate and the hex mod representation of each end of that link. To find the cell at runtime, I just need to make sure the graph for the other chunk is loaded, find cells within the target hexagon, then find the specific cell linking back to us. With the help of a few unit tests, I managed to iron out most of the bugs and was ready to move on. Next, I worked on my A star implementation. As I mentioned, A star is a pretty simple algorithm. And here's my code. I start with a priority queue ordered by expected cost. That's the actual expended cost, plus the estimated cost remaining. I load up the origin and destination chunks and find the cells containing those endpoints. I add a single state object into the priority queue, representing the root state the one where we haven't moved anywhere. Then, as long as there are states in the queue, I pop one off and check if we've found the destination. If so, then hooray, we are ready to construct a path from the final state. I'll skip over this step for now, and we'll come back to this after I've shown you how the states get built up. Normally, the state will not be at our destination. In that case, I consider each of the outbound portals for the state's cell. For portals within the same chunk, I just create a new state with an updated cost and a reference back to the state that got us there. If this is the first time we've considered the cell at the other end of the portal, or we've beaten our previous best cost to get there, then we update the best state for that target, and add the new state into the queue so that we can branch out from there later. Portals pointing to other chunks are mostly handled the same way, except we first need to make sure the other part of the graph is loaded, and find the cell we should be linking to first. And that's all there is to A-star. When we do find the destination, we need to reconstruct the path we took to get there. But that's as simple as following the parent links between the relevant states, reversing them, and storing any data we might need later. Most important is those shared mesh edges that we cross as we move from one triangle to another. Before implementing the string pulling algorithm, I wrote a dummy version that just uses the midpoint of the shared edges. The result was looking surprisingly good. Next, I implemented the simple stupid funnel algorithm. Much of the rest of my code has been cobbled together in one big class before being broken up once I knew how it was going to work. I did things the other way around when I implemented this algorithm. I was a little nervous about some of the maths and logic, so I wanted to be a bit more deliberate about it. I wrote a funnel class that could support each of the operations I needed. I used the fact that in a left-handed coordinate system like the one I use, if you ignore the Y component of two vectors and take their cross product, the result will have a positive Y component if and only if the first vector is to the left of the second. The funnel class gets the portals passed into it one after the other. The algorithm needs to look forward by one portal anytime it moves the apex forward, so I keep a buffer of a single portal. As each portal gets passed in, it goes into the buffer. If there was something already in the buffer, then we process that. Just as I described earlier, it considers moving each of the left side and right side of the funnel forward, if and only if doing so would narrow the funnel. If accepting those points would cause the sides of the funnel to cross over, then we must be going around a corner, so we record a new path segment 
and set up the funnel again at that corner, pulling the new funnel sides out of the buffer. I probably could have avoided the buffer if I instead allowed the funnel to be in an uninitialized state, but this approach felt cleaner to me. With the funnel algorithm implemented, we're not quite finished though. The funnel algorithm unfortunately ignores the y-axis, so the path we get out of it would clip even worse than A-star as we moved over bumpy terrain. So I do one final cleanup step before handing the path off to the troll. I take each path segment and the list of shared edges we crossed and find each of their intersections. Those are the points of inflection where the terrain might start tending up or down, so they're the points I pass back to the troll. And here's the end result. It doesn't look all that impressive, and in many ways it's not yet. Given there are no obstacles for the troll to avoid, these algorithms are just a really complicated way of laying a straight line down over the terrain. But I have confidence the troll will now be able to walk around any tree or structure that I put in its way. So that's what I'm going to work on for next episode. I'm going to add server controlled trees and stones back into the game so that I can start testing some gameplay mechanics that combine resource gathering with combat. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and give it a thumbs up. And remember, you can now directly support the series through my new Patreon page. If you want a recap of how I implemented my client-side harvesting system before next episode, you might want to check out episode 6. Or why not binge the whole series to date with the devlog playlist. But until next time, happy game developing. <laughs>